Tonight, the year is 1997. John Howard is Prime Minister. Pauline Hanson launches One Nation. And rock star Michael Hutchins dies. So much serenity. At the box office, the castle is raking it in. But it's not a house, it's a home. And the small Victorian country town of Moi hits the headlines. Jaden Lesky vanished from a home in Moi more than two weeks ago. The heartbroken ago. mother of Jaden Lesky. The man who was looking after the child. Babysitter Greg Demazovic. Police began an extensive search of nearby grassland but found no clues to the little boy's disappearance. It's where Jaden Lesky. A 13-month-old toddler goes missing. After 17 days of nothing, the chances of finding Jaden alive now are very, very remote. What follows is a murder investigation unlike any other, which begins with a bizarre attack using a pig's head and ends with the arrest and trial of Greg Domasevich, the little boy's babysitter. OK, he's got him. I just want him back. Nearly all with a role to play in this case will feel scorched and brutally exposed in the relentless and intense reporting by the media. Lives and relationships will be openly judged and their working class environment scrutinised. Tonight, we'll re-examine the police investigation of Jaden Liskey's murder, the fiercely fought defence case, will reveal why the jury let the prime suspect go free. The Supreme Court jury has cleared 30-year-old Domasevich of killing the little boy. And we'll ask the questions Greg Domasevich never faced in court in his first television interview in 20 years. There was no accident? No. <laughs> There's a big difference from an accident, you know, to say murder. Good evening, I'm Liz Hayes, and this is Under Investigation. Joining me, Roland Legg, the former Victoria Police homicide detective who led the investigation into Jaden Liskey's murder. Keith Moore, the experienced crime reporter who covered the case for Melbourne's Herald Sun. Historian Dr Elise Rosser, who has researched child murders in Australia with a focus on the Jaden Liskey case. And the Honourable Anthony Wheely QC, former Supreme Court judge and one of the country's leading barristers. Why is it that this case looms so large still to this day? What is it, Keith Moore, that makes you still want to write about this story? Look, a lot of people compared it early on to the Azari Chamberlain case. The public were really fascinated by it. And obviously the fact that a person was charged and then acquitted, it's still unsolved. And uh, everybody has a view on it. Uh, Roland Legg, you headed up the investigation. This is a case that has unfinished business for you. Well, you always regret that you didn't win a case at the end of the day. But first of all, you're investigating the ultimate crime. And obviously, you would like someone to pay a price and justice be seen to be done. And, and, and that, I think, becomes even more important when it's the life of an innocent, defenceless child. At least from your perspective, uh, what is it about this trial? Because it had a huge impact, didn't it, socially? A lot of the media coverage essentially constructed Moi as a site of rural failure, where they're like, look at all these individuals um, and, you know, how, how awful they are and how disadvantaged they are and how bogan they are. And that was the word that was never said often but was implied constantly. Uh, and Judge? Well, <clears throat> I think the media and other people clearly expected that the accused would be found guilty of this crime. But uh, as it turned out, he was acquitted. And this is a justification of the strength of the jury system. Yes, a killer has gone free, but who that killer is remains an unsolved mystery.
Well, uh, let's go through what we do know. On Saturday, June 14th, 1997, Greg Domasevich, a 28-year-old unemployed mechanic, went to the home of his girlfriend, Belinda Murphy, and asked if he could babysit her son, Jaden, for the afternoon. Belinda was headed out with her sister, and after a big night of drinking, Greg would later pick her up and drive her home. But Belinda would never see her son again. And to her horror, six months later, Jaden's body was discovered in a dam. He had been murdered. Greg Domasevich's account of that day and night is at times unbelievable and will make him the central suspect. This is your opportunity now to tell us what happened. Nothing, is it? Nothing happened. He'd looked after Jaden a number of times before, and this time Greg claimed Jaden happily played that afternoon as he worked on his car. Jaden, he said, did have a small accident causing a bloody nose, but nothing serious. And in the evening, he put the toddler to bed. At about 2 a.m., Greg drives to a pub in a nearby town to collect Belinda. He says he leaves Jaden sleeping. What happens next is an incident so bizarre, it will catapult this case to national attention. Unbeknown to Greg, waiting outside his place is a small gang planning a gruesome attack on his house. Armed with a pig's head, Moe local Kenny Penfold has come seeking retribution because he believed Greg treated his sister Yvonne poorly when they had been in a relationship. After Greg drove out that night, Kenny and one of his mates hurled the pig's head at the windows of the house. When Greg returns with Belinda, he sees the pig's head and the damage done. It's then, he says, that he realises Jaden is missing. Front door is still secure, you got here. OK, you walk in. And you like, a little fella was in there, and... The panic, I just believe, still, like, you know, he's only a party, but he might, you know, got scared and... Did you tell Belinda? Greg says he panics, takes Belinda, who is extremely intoxicated, to her home, then heads out into the night to search for the missing toddler. And so the stage is set for a case that will electrify Australia. A little boy lost, his babysitter, and a bizarre pig's head attack. The media sniffed the story and journalists raced to Murray, a quiet country town 150 kilometres east of Melbourne. Joining the media throng was today extra regular Shelley Horton, who at the time was the crime reporter for ABC Radio. Do you feel like they're accusing you? The pig's head story and the man who threw it, Maui local Kenny Penfold, hit the front page. So what happened was Greg was on and off with Yvonne and on and off with Belinda. So Kenny decided that he was going to prove a point and get back at Greg Domasevich by throwing a pig's head through his window. So he and a couple of mates, obviously on the beers, decided to throw this pig's head. They threw it and then they took off. Threw a pig's head through his window. Just make him leave my sister alone a little bit. Been hassling her out for a while. During an interview, Kenny said, uh, I'll use Kenny's words to as far as I can, my heart was pumping through my chest. I launched the pig's head and next morning I'd come round the corner and there's effing coppers everywhere. And I thought to myself, you've got to be effing joking, don't you? All this for an effing pig's head. To walk into this investigation must have been like a minefield. A lot of unbelievable characters. You don't have the child. You don't know whether the child's dead or alive. You want to try to find out whether the, the pig's head people are, are, are merely a coincidence or whether they're directly involved. I, I think, and then all these other things with um, these relationships, 
I think one of my first comments was, this isn't a family tree, it's a forest. Despite the complex relationships and troubled histories, police quickly ruled out the Pig's Head gang as suspects. Roland Legg's team decided there was no evidence anyone had entered Greg Domasevich's house to take Jaden. They reached that conclusion even though two windows had been smashed in the attack. Now, this one on the lounge room, it, it, it's a high, higher window than the other one. But right along the bottom of it, there's jagged glass. And there are shards up here. So that's the wider gap. And anybody who was intending to climb through there would, have, would be impossible to do it, considering the jagged pieces at the bottom. But in what was considered their first mistake, Roland Legg's police team did not examine inside the house for fingerprints. But why not fingerprint all of the material in the house, particularly those objects that looked like they had been used by someone other than Greg? Well, we, we, we were looking at it, but it wasn't... They weren't in there for a social event. If they went in there to get the child, they're not going to be sitting down and having a drink. Even though Roland and his forensic team say with complete conviction and certainty that no one could have got through the window, there was one person who gave evidence that he could and that was Kenny Penfold. He said, yeah, I could have done that. Because he was quite a skillful burglar, as we know. And he would got through windows in his time. So against that background, just with that possibility, even if it's a remote possibility, the sensible thing to do would be to fingerprint the place from head to foot. And that would prove that no one had been in there. That's what didn't happen. I can see where the judge is coming from, and I'm not completely discounting it, but that would also have given... We would have then been accepting that someone could have got in, which we believed 100% they hadn't. True, that's what you can do, but you've got to be able to have the thinking, fingerprinting done first before you can mount the secondary argument. Yeah. Look, I, I, I know what you're saying. Uh, I... Well, I'm not saying I'm just saying that's yeah, the way the yeah, defence sure, did it. Sure. You know. we, we, with the whole circumstances uh, of our investigation, we're confident, obviously, uh, that those people ultimately were not involved in removing the child. That doesn't mean they were all absolutely reliable. <laughs> Been caught up in this bizarre and now I can't go nowhere. I'd never dream of doing something like that. I haven't got the stomach for doing that sort of stuff anyway. It just makes me sick to think that someone else would do it. Kenny Penfold maintained he was innocent of any involvement in Jaden Leskey's disappearance. An early insight into just how difficult the police investigation would be was checking out Kenny Penfold's story in minute detail, right down to the solid evidence he claimed he'd left behind on the night of the pig's head attack. So, as part of his alibi, Kenny actually said to Detective Senior Sergeant Roland Legg, Look, I was really nervous about throwing it, so I did a poo at, on near the railway tracks. And I didn't have any toilet paper, so I ripped my flanny pocket off to wipe myself. I said to him, now, Kenny, a couple of detectives are going to take you back to Domasevich's house. And I want you to go through every aspect of exactly what occurred, exactly what you saw. So he took them over to the railway line, to the long grass where um, where uh, uh, they'd been laying in wait for Domasevich to leave the house. And he started marching up and down the railway line, apparently searching for something, uh, which he found and held up to them. And they said, what's, th what's the story here? And he said, well, I didn't have anything to wipe my ass with. That's my shirt pocket. It was the kind of truth-telling that helped take Kenny Penfold and his pig's head gang off the suspect list but police were already gathering evidence against Greg Domasevich. Although he claims their focus on him was because of complaints he had made previously about local police. What Roland Legg's investigators did find was $600 in wet money under Greg's mattress and later a wet wallet. This curious find would bolster their case against Greg when Jaden's body was found six months later in a nearby dam. That was interesting, the, the wet money under the mattress. That's an intriguing find. 
Um, and again, something consistent with another element that we had of, of the wallet. You'd wonder why somebody would take $600 with them if they're going to dive into a dam and get it all soaked, but they might. In their second apparent failure, police, having found wet money under his mattress, did not thoroughly investigate the clothes Greg wore the night of Jaden's disappearance. And while the house was still locked up uh, or, or sealed off, we took him back there and there was a pile of clothing in a rear room. And we said, well, Greg, can you uh, tell us what you were wearing on that night? And he said, yeah, sure. So he proceeded to pick up one piece at a time and sniff it. Now, how that was going to identify what he was wearing on the night, I don't know, but, but, we, but, but, we, didn't ever, we didn't ever establish exactly what he was wearing that could, night. But I just raise, uh, again, the defence case. Attacked your crime scene examiner quite stringently. The crime scene examiner never identified or photographed the clothing that was in the clothes basket in the laundry. So that if the case was going to be that Greg rushed home and got rid of his wet clothes, why didn't the crime scene examiner take the trouble to check the very obvious thing, namely the clothes in the dirty clothes basket, which he said he didn't do that, but he did notice that whatever was in there was wet. But what was it? Was it a towel? Was it clothes? We don't know. And so that left that possibility unexplored as well. While the eyes of Australia were on Moi, in Moi, police eyes and ears were on Greg Domasevich. A little boy was still missing, and Roland Legg wanted the babysitter kept under close surveillance. Um, I, I wanted Greg Domasevich followed at an early stage. Uh, that evening, I uh, uh, contacted Melbourne. I said, I want a surveillance, a full surveillance team down here now because I'm going to have to give him his car back. It's the only wheels we can give him to be on the move. And there are two reasons for that. Either he had left the child somewhere with someone and it all got out of control, um, if he was responsible, or um, the child was already dead. And as has been known to happen in the past, someone might have disposed of a body uh, very quickly without considering it and suddenly think, oh, no, I should have buried it, or, oh, no, I should have put it somewhere else. So there are all those considerations. But the extensive surveillance of Greg Domasevich failed to turn up any leads. Coming up, the tragedy and its cast of characters. So I guess the central people who were involved in the case, I think they were represented as the most bizarre of the bizarre. Then, the police swoop. On July 16th, 1997, Greg Domasevich was arrested and charged with murder. That's next on Under Investigation. It's June 1997, and the nation's attention is drawn to Moi, the small Victorian country town where 13-month-old Jaden Leskey has gone missing. Suspicions are centred on Jaden's babysitter, 28-year-old Greg Domasevich, who was looking after him while his mother Belinda was on a planned night out drinking. The police have Greg under constant surveillance, but he leads them nowhere. If the police are able to come up with enough, enough circumstantial evidence that Jaden is no longer alive, then a conviction is still possible. With the search for Jaden intensifying, police were trying to build their case against the man they believed knew where he was, Greg Domasevich. Across the country, this story is making front page news. The media continued to be irresistibly drawn to the case and its cast of characters. Greg and Belinda, Kenny Penfold and his sister Yvonne, and their tangled relationships, which saw Kenny and his crew throw a pig's head at Greg's house late in the night, the same night little Jaden Leskey disappeared. But the town of Moi also came under the spotlight.
Thiers was a Moi local at the time and remembers the unkind depiction of the people who lived there. They referred to us as hillbillies and uh, one reporter said something about the fact that when you're in Maui, it's like a scene playing out of the film of Deliverance. Uh, you know, all of that sort of stuff. It was just really, really, really bad to put up with because we'd never seen ourselves in that light. Well, Elise, uh, you've looked into the impact socially of this case. Uh, was this poverty on becoming a spectacle? Oh, absolutely. You don't remember me, do you? <laughs> I, I might remember your smell, sir, but not actually your face. And do you believe uh, that impacted the impression of Belinda... Absolutely. ..and Greg and Kenny and Yvonne and anybody else who was touched by this? I think they were represented as the most bizarre of the bizarre. And I think that it's sort of made for, you know, a soap opera. It made for dramatic, you know, dramatic television, dramatic media reporting. And it's like, oh, well, look how these people out in the country live. Oh, look what they do out there. They're all sleeping with each other's boyfriends and that's normal for them. And I think it, what it did especially, though, was it affected how Belinda was represented. And how did you think that A lot was... of the media basically discussed her as the failed mother. You know, media articles which say things like, um, had the headline, I wasn't drunk, I was very drunk. And they sort of really pitch it as she was a drunk, she went out, she left her child alone with a man. <laughs> I'd never leave my kids with, with anyone I didn't sort of trust. I mean, I regret everything now, but, I mean, you can't change anything. When Jaden disappeared, Greg Domasevich was Belinda's boyfriend, and initially in the investigation, she too was a suspect. We had the possibility of, of Belinda covering up for Greg in some way, um, and, and she was of course, in those early stages, not in a great state herself to get any sort of uh, clear, and, clear and, story and, from. And, and she was supporting Greg early in the piece. Oh, she was. I, and this was another thing. Uh, one, one of our strategies, and I don't think it's any secret, is that after some time and we were beginning to focus more and more on him as our suspect, um, or our star suspect, I suppose you'd say, um, it was in our interest to uh, alienate them um, not by any deceptive way, but to just sit her down and say, look, Belinda, we're thinking that, that you might be involved or we're thinking that Greg's involved or whatever. And, and we, it's very difficult in a situation like this too because you're trying to be sympathetic towards the mother who has a missing child and, and um, uh, who we believe by this stage is dead. And you, you, know, you want to put her through as little pain as you can. But she yet was... And she just continuing, went back to him. She, well, she was maintaining a relationship with the, the man that you believed was responsible. Yes, and I mean, on, on, on day one, she indicated to us, can only, can only be Greg. But he was constantly telling her that Jaden was still alive. I was constantly telling her that Jaden was most likely dead. And as a mother, she preferred what he was saying to what I was saying. In his early police interviews, Greg rambled and contradicted himself. You're the person who's cleaned it up. You haven't been drinking, you haven't been using drugs, you haven't been taking medication. Why can't you remember? We're talking six days ago. And probably one of the most biggest events that's happened in your life, the disappearance that's, of this child. That's what I mean, yeah. You know, I'm under a lot of pressure too. He later said he was simply exhausted. What have you done to Jade? I haven't done anything to After a month of digging, Roland Legg and his investigative team were convinced of Greg's guilt. But the police case was entirely circumstantial. 
There was no one piece of conclusive evidence and no body. Yet on July 16, 1997, police arrested Greg Domasevich and charged him with murder. This, this is pretty important. You're about to arrest this man in this very high profile case. You only have circumstantial evidence and it has to be pretty damn good, doesn't it? Well, we thought it was, but other people thought it wasn't. So but you, but you did. Really but... Oh, look, I, I, I was totally satisfied that we charged the right person. Then, six months after he disappeared, the body of little Jaden Lesky was found on New Year's Day, 1998. The terrible discovery was made at Blue Rock Dam, about 20 kilometres out of Maui. Once the body was recovered in January 1998, uh, there was a, a, a fairly broad opinion that this was, quote, the icing on the cake, because all that we discovered on that New Year's Day in 1998 pretty well confirmed all our theories. The police investigations had found that Greg's wallet was wet the night of Jaden's disappearance and that he placed wet money under his mattress. They also believed a crowbar used to weigh down Jaden's body belonged to Greg. But at his murder trial, everything, including the clothes Jaden was wearing when he was found, would be called into question. Belinda gave evidence that the T-shirt he was wearing was not the T-shirt she had given him or given Greg, that the tracksuit was not the tracksuit. So where, where had they come from? Who'd put those clothes on the child? And the sleeping bag she hadn't uh, taken to Greg's place that day. Where did the sleeping bag come from? There were things in the in the, in the sleeping bag, such as a, a bib, which she said she'd never, ever given Jaden. With the discovery of Jaden's body also came the terrible truth of how he died and his agonising final hours. Forensic pathologist Dr Shelley Robertson conducted the autopsy. The deceased Jaden Lesky had a broken arm which had been uh, splintered in some form, just using a piece of wood and uh, a bandage wrapped around that, splinting the arm. And in your opinion, what would it take to have a break like this? A, a blow of some sort, a direct blow to that region. There was also a head injury. How significant was that? That was quite significant. Do you believe that was the cause of death? Yes. This is not an accident? I don't believe so, no. And therefore, in your opinion, this child was murdered? Yes. On January 14th, 1998, little Jaden was buried. Coming up, Greg Domasevich breaks his 20 year silence. It was a mistake, and then ended up costing a young boy his life, you know, which is on me. Do you believe that the police focused only on you and no one else was ever considered? 100%. You didn't murder him, you didn't hit him on the head, you didn't break his arm? No. That's next on Under Investigation. With the tragic discovery of the body of 13-month-old Jaden Lesky, the police believed they nailed their case against the toddler's babysitter, 28-year-old Greg Domasevich. They argued there'd been an accident, possibly a carjack falling on Jaden and severely breaking his arm while Greg worked on his vehicle in the backyard. Greg, they believed, panicked, gave Jaden a prescribed drug which was found in the little boy's system and then killed him with a blow to the head and disposed of his body in a local dam. 
When his home was unexpectedly attacked by a group throwing a pig's head that night, Greg used it to explain Jaden's disappearance. But the police case failed spectacularly, and Greg Domasevich walked free. How and why that happened is an extraordinary story. But first, the man at the centre of it all. It's been more than 20 years since Greg Domasevich gave a television interview, but he agreed to sit down with me to talk about the case. And this is what he told me about his decades of agonising regret. Tell me about Jaden. What kind of boy was he? He was a great little kid, you know, like... Yeah, I don't know what to say. Like, he was good, loved the animals, loved, like, mucking around with stuff, like... Used to play, you know, like the, you know, Nintendo back then, and I just thought, like, you know, he's a little fella growing up, and you know, he's surrounded by women, and I'm thinking, you know, sort of like, you know, he needs to, um, you know, get into cars and shooting or fishing or something, you know. As I understand it, to this day, you still blame yourself for Jaden's disappearance? Mm -hmm. Of course. Why do you say that? If I didn't leave the house to pick up Belinda, nothing would have happened. So that afternoon when you picked up Jaden, you took him back to your place, and uh, what did you do in the afternoon? I was just, like, mucking around in the car. And, yeah, but he just spent, like, the afternoon, you know, like, while I was doing that, you know? just playing with the dogs. It was stated that um, whilst you were working on the car, perhaps the car had been jacked up and had fallen. No, there's a big difference from an accident, you know, to say murder or something like, but nothing happened at all, you know, that while he was at my house, it was just like he had a little fall, you know, cleaned him up, this and that, and we were off again, you know, he was playing like... So that afternoon he did have uh, an accident and he did hurt himself, but it wasn't serious? Oh, it was nothing. Like, yeah, it, 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 sorry, I shouldn't say it like that, but, yeah, it was just like, yeah, it bumped his nose and he had like a, yeah, like a nose bleed, I remember that, and I just... Yeah, wanted to clean it up. I didn't see it happen, you know, or anything, you know. Like, he just came up when I was, you know, still working on the car, and I went, oh, jeez, you know. And then, yeah, just, like, wiped his nose, told him to blow his nose and that, and... You've said there's a big difference between an accident and murder. I, I, I only ask you this because I, I... People might see that as you going, look, something accidental occurred rather than murder. The cops, when they first arrested me, saying, look, we just, you know, tell us where he is. We'll give you, you know, like, two years or something. You're going to be two years on remand anyway. It's like, if an accident happens, it's an accident. But, like, you know, they said, oh, the car fell off the jack. It wasn't even on a jack. It was on ramps, you know. And it didn't fall off at all? No. When you got home that night and realised the windows to your house had been smashed, there was a pig's head outside. What did you think? At first, my initial thought I can remember was like, you know, my seeing the broken glass on, like as you're coming into the front door, like that window. I thought, fuck, someone's molly toffed, you know, me house. Thank fuck, you know, it didn't work or go off because Jaden's in there and, you know, he would have, you know, like burnt to death or something. But you found that Jaden was missing at that stage. How did you feel? I don't know. It's like shit, you know? Like, he is not here. You didn't tell Belinda that Jaden's missing at that point? No, because I just thought I could find him. You knew instantly who had thrown that pig's head at your window, did you? I had very strong, yeah, pretty much, yes. You felt you knew instantly it was related to um, Yvonne and Kenny Penfold? Yeah, well, I had no other, you know, 
and it, like people trouble anywhere else except just from her and the police. You chose still not to seek their help? <laughs> not for them fucking mutts. The police say that a, a person couldn't have climbed through the window, the broken window, there was not enough room. What do you say about that? Absolute bullshit. You can see, you know, like in the pictures, it was like a two metre by one metre, you know, hole through glass and being smashed, you know, you know, right down to like the window sort of frame in some places, you know. Do you believe that the police focused only on you, that you were their target always and no one else was ever considered? Yes, I mean, yeah, 100%. And why do you think that was the case? Well, I, I was the, you know, only one to say that I seen him and I was the last to see him. They took my car, you know, um, they forensiced it, you know. There was no forensic evidence to show you'd been to the dam, is what you're saying? Yeah. Can you explain how you had money that was considered wet under your mattress and a wet wallet? My car leaked water and because I had like, yeah, like, you know, you crawl under the car sort of thing. It was like my wallet was in the back and I just threw it in the, you know, front floor of the car, which was wet. How did you feel then when Jaden's body was found? in the dam. Mm -hmm. What was your reaction? Just anger and pain and just I was crying. I don't know. Yeah, it's just like, who could do something like that, you know? Like, and that is the question, who could do something like that? A sick person, someone maybe iced out or something like you, drugged out. Somebody with fucking problems. After 16 months behind bars and accused of murdering a helpless child, Greg Domasevich emerged from the Supreme Court free to go home to his mum. When you heard the jury come back and say, not guilty, what was that like? <laughs> sort of like, thank God, you know, and then I thought, all right, what happens now? And then, you know, the guards at the, you know, court said, Greg, like, you can go. And I go, what, really? Like, I can just walk now and go? And it's sort of like shock, or overwhelming. You had been found not guilty, but the court of public opinion still is quite damning. There was no accident? No accident, like I said. It's like... You didn't... You didn't murder him, you didn't hit him on the head, you didn't break his arm. No, it's just... You didn't try and bandage it up as it, the, as it was found when his body was retrieved. No. So in other words, there's no part of you that has contributed to this little boy's death other than you saying him you left the, the house. Just a mistake and then... Ended up costing a young boy his life, you know, which is on me. Coming up, the pig's head team in court. I'm talking frothing at the mouth, banging on the table like this. How the police case crumbled. That's a very tight time frame. But it's far from impossible. That's next on Under Investigation. Greg Domasevich's murder trial began at the Supreme Court of Victoria on October the 12th, 1998. His defence team, headed up by the flamboyant and ferocious QC, the late Colin Lovett, launched a blistering attack. Lovett forcefully argued police had focused almost entirely on Greg Domasevich and not fully investigated other potential suspects. Still, to most, it seemed, the verdict was a foregone conclusion. 
Is that how you felt, Roland? I don't know whether I mix in the wrong circles, but uh, the majority of people with whom I spoke were pretty much um, yeah, believing that, uh, that Greg was responsible. Uh, if you were a member of the public looking at the media coverage, I think it would be a little question as to, you know, who was guilty and who would be convicted. And Keith, did you feel as though that the police probably had a compelling a case? Yes, I certainly did. And, and look, to this day, I think uh, Greg was saved by, uh, by the Pig's Head team and more importantly, having Colin Lovett. The late Colin Lovett QC was a legend of the law a highly theatrical and articulate attack dog. I, uh, I thought this case was a weak case and I, I always thought that. His first mission was to eviscerate the pig's head team, Kenny Penfold and his mates, who had carried out the bizarre attack on Greg's house the night of Jaden's disappearance. Kenny and his pig's head mate, Tubby Hopkinson, went berserk in the courtroom abusing lawyers and the judge, and completely unravelling under Colin Lovett's fierce cross-examination. The prosecution chose to put the team, the pig's head team, into the witness box. Uh, that was a good idea. Well, it was the only thing we could do. Uh, we, we thought, and, and look, it was always thought with danger, but also we're obliged to provide the court with all available evidence. Do you and think uh, sometimes, some, sometimes that doesn't go the way you like. Do you think their antics in the court, their behaviour in the court, um, impacted poorly with the oh, jury? Certainly. Mr Lovett, as he's entitled to do, saw them as the perfect targets and was goading them. He wanted explosions in the witness box, there's no doubt about that. And he got, <laughs> and he got what he dreamed for. I'm talking frothing at the moon, banging on the table like this, having security guards thinking, we've got to stop this. And it just, it really, and it went on and on and on. And then remembering in the summing up, he said, remember, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, when Toby was in the witness box, when Kenny was in the witness box, remember how deranged they were. He actually used the word deranged. To former judge Anthony Wheely, the Crown Prosecution's case against Greg, based on Roland Legg's police investigation, seemed flawed even before the trial began. Well, the Crown case was that uh, Greg, probably accidentally or in a bit of a fit of anger, um, injured the child who died. He then had to decide what to do. He'd take it to her place, put the body in the cot, and when she woke up the next morning after a big night out, she'd think maybe it was her fault. I mean, that always struck me as a pretty implausible case, and they didn't run with it eventually. What made it implausible to Well, you? if you woke up and found your baby had died with a fractured skull, it was hardly a cot death, was it, you know? And yet you'd come home and gone to bed full of grog, so how did it happen? You know, it doesn't strike me as, as particularly logical. But anyway, it didn't work out that way because the Crown said that when he came home to his place with Belinda in the car, and presumably the body over at her place, he then sees the pig head and the, and the broken glass. So cunningly, he changes his whole strategy. And he then follows a timeline where he rescues the body from the house at her place and ultimately buries it in the dam. Our judge also argues that the prosecution's theory that Greg suddenly decides to exploit the pig's head attack to cover for having killed and disposed of Jaden's body was a bit of a stretch. Now, normally a Crown case that's going to succeed is pretty simple. Uh, here, I think it was such a complex thing and it required a sort of arch villain and, you know, cunning, inventive, creative, uh, able to move quickly with changing circumstances. Was Greg Domasevich that person? He didn't look like it to me. Uh, yeah, he was quick-witted at times, but he was pretty stupid other times. Uh, I don't see him as that arch villain, and, but the Crown had to show that he was, and I think that made it difficult. Roland, your turn. Take on all that, eh? We believe there was enough time and sometimes desperate situations call for desperate measures that you might think a person is incapable of doing, but is so desperate they might do it. 
The tight timeline, it was argued, made it near impossible for Greg to dispose of Jaden's body. After dropping Belinda home, Greg was stopped at 3.30 a.m. for a random breath test. The police case was that Greg returned to his home, collected Jaden's body and disposed of it in a dam 20 kilometres away. Greg then returned to Belinda's house and both went to Moe Police Station. Now, we know that he's pulled up by the police at 3.30, so let's say 3.35, he leaves that scene and the police drive away. So he's got between 3.35 and 4.45 to get home, to collect the things that he wants to dump the body in, uh, to put all the body in the sleeping bag with the other items, to tie the crowbar to it, uh, and then to put all that back in the car and then drive to the dam, dump the body, get back out, get in your car, drive home, get rid of your clothes, put the wet money under your mattress, uh, leave your wet wallet in the car, put some new clothes on and get around to Belinda's place by 4.45. That's a very tight time frame. It is tight, but what we're saying is the scene was set. All he had to do after he was pulled over by the police was to go home, get a piece of rope and a crowbar, and drive uh, that distance on a deserted, open country road. OK, it's tight, but it's far from impossible. And it was, you say, oh, that, doable. That's our theory. That, yeah. that was our case. And, and as I say, I've had a lot of time to think about it, and um, it hasn't swayed me from our initial th theory. Coming up, the stunning verdict. It's a tough place to be, isn't it? You're, you're oh, it can the, be. You're the head of it the investigation. Be. Well, that's So much was riding on it and it failed. That's next on Under Investigation. For more than six weeks, the trial of Greg Domasevich for the murder of 13-month-old toddler Jaden Liskey dominated the nightly news and daily headlines. The media and the public expected a guilty verdict, but Domasevich's fiery defence barrister, the late Colin Lovett QC, demolished the prosecution case, successfully casting serious doubts about Greg's culpability. Over three days, the jury examined a bizarre trail of circumstantial evidence that ranged from mathematics to mayhem to reach their unanimous verdict. Good evening. After four days of deliberations, the Supreme Court jury has cleared 30-year-old Domasevich of killing the little boy. And I would just like to thank the League team of Colin Lovett, Michael Arthur and John Lee for everything they've done. Uh, How did you feel, Greg? Yeah, no, it wasn't great. When they said not guilty, how did you feel? When they said not guilty, how did you feel? Uh, a tough one for you to have to hear, I think, Roland. Oh, we were disappointed. I mean, it was never 100%. But based on what you heard in the court and what you saw in the court oh, and what you all, know happened in the court... It was always a possibility. Maybe I should ask you this, Judge. Uh, would you have been surprised if Greg Domasevich had been found guilty? Unfortunately, a criminal trial is not a search for the truth. Um, some people wish it were, but it's not that. It's a test between the state and an individual citizen and that high burden is there to protect people. They may be guilty, but that burden's put there to protect them against 
the might of the state. And the reason that burden is so high, it's based on the ancient British principle, and it's, it's roughly, it's far better to let 10 guilty men go free mm. than it is for one innocent person to go to jail. It's Hard so... for the community to accept that, but I suppose that's right. But yeah. the, the truth is we're left with Greg Domasiewicz, quite rightly, can say he's not guilty. Mm. He's been found not guilty, yeah. yeah. Is he innocent? Well, that's something other people will debate. Hang on, what are you going to... Hang on, would you like to say something to yourself? Get the Adding further to the public perception that a guilty man had walked free, a coronial inquest eight years later determined Greg Domasevich probably contributed to Jaden's death and that it was likely he had disposed of his body. Listen to the sentence next time, mate, OK? Greg, right. we did it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, thank thank you. you. Good ones. Good. Greg, a coroner did determine that you had disposed of Jaden's body and that you had some responsibility in this. That was just part of the corroboration squad and there's no evidence like... You didn't dispose of his body? No. Greg has always contested the coronial finding, which did not change the jury's verdict in the Supreme Court that he was not guilty. Here you are, a man who was put before the courts, you were found not guilty. Uh, but all these years later, you carry the burden of a public who thinks you are. Because the police never done their job properly. Have you ever felt innocent? I feel innocent, yeah, of course, like, but I've got this, like, guilt thing that if I just didn't fuck up and leave him at home, you know, there'd be a, you know, little boy out there and you don't even know, like, it's just the worst thing, like, all I can say is I promise that I did not kill Jaden, but... Out of all that, you know, I lost all my house, all my assets, everything, like, to pay for, you know, the case and this and that. But to me, well, you know, the, you know, bullet you got to bite on because, you know, it was ultimately me that he's not with us now, you know? For years after Jaden's murder, his mother Belinda continued to believe Greg was innocent. Because I know myself that I had nothing to do with it. Is that swear? And Belinda? I've never believed Greg done it. Never, ever. Never will. How do, how do you feel about Belinda today? I just, you know, I'd love to say, like, sorry again like to give her like peace which you know I wish you could have you know like just to know you know the thing of unknowing is just must be just 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 unbearable you know and but there is nothing this, you know what can I say Belinda had never seen Greg's police interviews until Keith Moore sent her a copy of the videotapes years later. I've got an email from Belinda. So this is 2003, long time afterwards. Dear Keith, I just thought I'll let you know that the tape arrived today and thank you. I feel it in my heart and I know it in my head and I've never been so ashamed of myself. God knows why I visited him in jail, gave him money, bought him presents, and confessed love to the mongrel. It's going to take a long, long time to get over this, if ever I do at all. Thanks for making it so clear to me. In my mind. This case was sensational in every meaning of that word. Nearly 24 years on, the murder of Jaden Lesky remains unsolved. A source of pain, grief and regret for all involved, including everyone here. One thing is certain, a killer or killers are still walking free. From everything you've heard, 
here at the table. Has anything changed in your view uh, about this case? No, look, after you know more than 20 years of covering this, my belief is still that, uh, that, that Greg never intended any harm to Jaden. He, he, he was fond of Jaden, but my personal belief is that uh, Greg is responsible. Well, and I have to say that he absolutely has not been found guilty, uh, so therefore he is not responsible. Uh, Lisa, anything you heard here today and, and the interview with Greg that changed any of your perceptions or thoughts? Not so much changed them, but um, I would say it reinforces how important I think this case is and will continue to be. But even if it was resolved tomorrow, you know, if somebody got a guilty verdict, I think it would still linger sort of in our collective consciousness. So do you... Roland, um, have any regrets? Wish you'd done things differently? There were reasons that things were done the way they were. Um, my opinion is that we did still have a, a strong circumstantial case. But, um, yeah, I, I accept as I should uh, full responsibility for everything that took place. It's a tough place to be, isn't it? You're, you're, oh, it can the, be. you're the head of it the investigation. Well, that's so I much to. was riding on it and it failed. And you haven't changed your mind about who the prime suspect is, who did this? Uh, not at all, no. Judge, finally. I've been very interested in what everyone's had to say, uh, but in the end, I think, from my reading anyway, the result, although disappointing for many people, was probably justified. Sadly, it must be uh, recalled that so many lives have been ruined by these events. Uh, Jaden him himself lost, um, Belinda, Greg, and many others around them. Their lives were ruined. Everybody is eager to find the truth. Everybody's eager to find um, uh, a culprit. Uh, but sometimes we can't do it successfully within the justice system, and that's the way it is. And that's the way it is with this case? That's the way it is with this case. Of course, if there's still someone out there who knows something, whose memory or guilt may have been sparked by what you have seen and heard, perhaps it's time to speak up. We're all still wanting to know what happened to Jaden Leskeen. Thank you all for joining me and thank you. I'm Liz Hayes. Good night. Hello, I'm Liz Hayes. Thanks for watching our brand new event series, Under Investigation. Subscribe to our channel now for more great stories from both Under Investigation and 60 Minutes Australia. For other exclusive Under Investigation content, visit ninenow.com.au and the Nine Now app.